community of Houston, Texas, this is The Awakened Life with Rev. Howard Caesar. Unity is a non-denominational spiritual community providing a positive, practical, and progressive approach to Christianity. Let's join the service in progress now with Rev. Howard Caesar. Today we enter into part three of our series that I'm calling Beyond the Veil, and uh, obviously beyond the veil is meaning beyond what we know in this physical dimension. We teach that we are all eternal beings. Uh, we teach that there is no death, um, but there is something we all experience that has been labeled death, that some re, you know, perceive as kind of an end, but we have said is not an end uh, without a beginning. It's just a change in terms that we use are the word transition. Um, so we know that there is the known and the unknown, and uh, we know a great deal about the known, life in the physical uh, here on Earth. That's known. But we don't know a lot about uh, life after we lay this physical body down. That's an unknown. And for some, um, they have various ideas, of course, that have been handed down through religion and various other sources. But there is uh, an area or a way in which we are hearing and learning about what is beyond the veil, and that has come from uh, those individuals who have had an NDE, which is a near-death experience. And there are literally millions of them now uh, that have been reported and recorded. And uh, so we're going to use that as, a, as somewhat of a basis. And it's been meaningful to me in studying these near-death experiences, some of them that are able to come back with a whole host of uh, things that they've remembered and the commonality that exists within uh, many of them, that there is uh, teachings, ideas, and principles that resonate, really, with what many of the evolved masters and teachers and mystics and uh, avatars, and including Jesus Christ, uh, have shared down through time. And some of it has been beyond our ability to understand. Maybe some of it may be a bit deep for even us today. Um, but it, I want to say much of it also aligns with many of the teachings that we teach here at Unity about consciousness, about love, about the idea of oneness, uh, and many various aspects of the importance of of what is going on in our consciousness, thought, word, belief, idea, all of these kinds of things. So each of you can decide for yourselves, obviously, in terms of what we offer here, uh, because in the end it always comes down to whether or not you're going to integrate anything that is shared here and taught, uh, and whether you're going to live it uh, and have it become part of your life. We said that the scripture verse that we're using as a basis for this series is where Jesus said, believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, for I go to prepare a place for you. So lift out the piece, the piece that says, in my Father's house are many mansions. We said in part two that many mansions was mistranslated. It was actually many rooms, meaning that you can never leave the house of God. There are many, many rooms, meaning many realms, many dimensions uh, to life, maybe many universes. Uh, again, as far as our mind can reach and understand at this time. And so in this series, I am using as a source uh, several um, books that have been written that I found to be very credible and, and meaningful and powerful to me. And uh, the one of them is by uh, Anita Moriani, and I hope I'm pronouncing her name. Some say Morijani, but I'm gonna say Moriani. Uh, and her book was Dying to Be Me. A number of you I know know of the book and have read it, and it has impacted you as well. The other book that is uh, a source that I'm using is uh, written by Lynn Kathleen Russell, and the book is called The Wonder of You. Now, uh, Dying to Be Me is a book that is about uh, Anita's experience of um, dying and having a near-death experience through and having a, a profound healing. But in her near-death experience, there's a, a wealth of uh, things that she has shared, and I'm told that her audiobook and being told in her voice is very, very powerful all, as well. Um, and then the other book that I use mostly is uh, The Wonder of You. It's a compilation of near-death experiences and that the author uh, has researched and read 2,500 or more uh, near-death experiences and has pulled together those that had commonality 
Um, and uh, again, a very, very meaningful. One other um, book is The Proof of Heaven by Eben Alexander uh, that many of you have read as, as well. I promised today that there would be some things I would cover, so uh, I'm going to move quickly through them if at all possible. I feel like this could have probably been a 10-week series, um, but we'll do the best we can. Um, many who have had a near-death experience uh, tell us about a life review, and life review is one of the things I said I would share today uh, because many brought back uh, and valued so much from their life review and what it meant for them and changes that needed to be made. And so a life review is essentially where when they step to the other side and have these experiences near death, that they have their life flashed on like a screen of the universe before them. And most of it is shown in great detail, they say. Every action, even down to every thought they have had or ever had, good and bad, is revealed. And there is no time in this space. So it isn't like it, it goes on, for, you know, because to go through a lifetime of every thought. So there's something there that is beyond our ability to also comprehend, to be able to absorb all of that. For centuries, you know, that religion and other various sources have told us that uh, when you die, you're judged, and that you could potentially then go towards punishment. You know, some have believed in a hell, a location, uh, a geographical place, things like that. That was nothing, nothing like that was recorded by any of these individuals who had a near-death experience. In fact, they made it a point to address that none of that uh, was there and that they were embraced always by unconditional love and acceptance, even as they were reviewing the many things that they maybe did not do well. Uh, in their life up to that point. The main purpose, they said, of these life reviews they came to know was not to punish, but simply to help them with their growth and understanding as a soul, uh, as an eternal soul. And when shown actions that were kind and loving, uh, that individual in the life, watching the life, life review felt great satisfaction and joy. And then when they had and reviewed something that was unkind, they, they felt the pain and the sorrow at the same degree of intensity in which it was administered to whomever was the receiver of their anger or malice or hate or, or whatever it is that they were about that was unkind. And then they were asked after this, really, what is it that they had learned as a result of the review? And of course, uh, they had realizations and insights that came to them in terms of how they would change and alter their life. And they, all report, they all reported that they were their own judge and jury. And it was like there were two parts to themselves. There was the part that was able to uh, appraise what was going on in the life review, and then there was the other part that was reliving it and totally absorbed in uh, the, the experiencing the thoughts, the feelings, the deeds all over again. And then they got to see and feel the consequences of their behavior. Uh, and what it had caused in the individual or individuals that they hurt or helped. And uh, essentially, there was no hellfire. And, uh, but you can imagine the hell that a person or soul may have gone through in a life review if they had a whole lot that was issued that was confrontive, uh, resentful, anger, uh, attack, uh, you know, whatever, where the, a hatred, that all those feelings that had been issued to others, they come wave upon wave, it was experienced in the life review. That, if anything, was the hell as they experienced that kind of thing. Those who went through the life review were affected to the core um, and returned changed. And uh, many of uh, what I'm going to share is actually I'm, I'm, I'm reading what they have said mostly so that you really get the, the sense of how they said it and, um, and, and its impact from that standpoint. One near-death experience person named Amy reported, I lost my temper in horrible ways and I have had great trouble with forgiveness. I felt only love and forgiveness, however, through the life review. And I was able to feel exactly what others around me had felt during my life, how everything I did and said and even thought had touched others around me. I was able to even enter the minds and emotional centers of many. I felt their struggles and their own fears, their desperate need for love and approval. And more than anything, I could feel how childlike everyone was. 
I was able to see and feel with a higher mind and eye, and the feeling I had toward everyone was nothing less than what a loving mother would feel for her own children at toddler age. Surveying all of this, I felt a higher part of me had, that had compassion on the me that was so ignorant and juvenile. I desired to have my lower self awaken and be filled with love and joy. I am forever grateful for my life review and what I was able to take away from it. Another person named Bobby uh, shared, it was not what I did in physical life that mattered most. It was who I was, who I am inside my soul that was more important than any physical thing I did. In other words, clarifying, this person says it was only who I really was at the time in terms of my soul that was most important. It was as though you might think that maybe you could do bad things to others or have bad thoughts about others and it would be okay as long as you yourself remained a kind of a beautiful person. Wrong. I learned a lot. We are all part of one, she said. We should relish life, all life. You don't die. I have a greater respect for life. Don't hurt others. They are part of the same one you are. Don't judge. Seek understanding. Help others. There is so much more to life than meets the eye. There's an eight-year-old boy named Glauco. Uh, I don't know from what country he drowned and had a near-death experience, and he had a review, and um, this is what he shared. He said, my life was going backwards in this review, and I remember thinking, how bad can this be? I'm only eight years old. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> the first image I saw was something bad that I did. I used a key to scratch a car. And I could feel in the review the pain that I caused the owner because of my actions. And then I remember thinking, oh, no, I'm in trouble. And the angel or guide surprised me by saying, don't worry, these are just lessons. And I remember thinking, oh, crap, he can read my mind, too. <laughs> <laughs> and he heard that, too, and gave me this lovely, kind of beautiful smile um, after that thought. The movie was showing second by second my entire life. Everything I did had a life of its own, like when I felt the owner of the car's feelings and thoughts. And then he told his wife about it, and I could feel her pain, too. And then on and on and on. It's like ripples that uh, a person's pain can go on and be felt. There was a person named Hafur. Uh, he got, fr got from her experience as a lady this. I realized that there was no judging or punishing God like religions say there is, and that it was my mind with an expanded consciousness that judged itself and sifted its actions through the filter of perfect conscious love. Everything is recorded, she said, in a universal memory, even the most insignificant things. So a life review uh, was basically a learning experience for all of them, and it was to help a person understand their connection with others and with life, to realize that basically every contact with another person, every interaction causes ripples that are sent out into the universe. And so this awareness is meant to help us grow toward oneness in the source. I told you last week that I would try and touch upon some of their concepts or understandings of heaven and hell from their awareness on that side. Anita Moriani, in her book, Don't, uh, or Dying to Be Me, she shares that uh, heaven is not a place, I realized. It is a state from within. Heaven is a state of mind. Heaven is right here, inside of me. In reality, no heaven and he or hell, in reality, no heaven and hell out there exists on the other side of the veil. It's all here with us. And she, says, she says, more accurately, it is within our own selves. Now, doesn't that ring true? Jesus saying, it's not, the kingdom of heaven is not low here or low there, but the kingdom of heaven is within you. We teach that. The book, The Wonder of You, tells an interesting near-death experience <clears throat> that <clears throat> um, was had by a soldier uh, who was in the middle of a war. And the man tells how he himself had become a mean, tough person uh, 
who trained Green Berets and, and knew how to kill and was all about killing. And uh, he says he cared nothing for the enemy uh, as human beings. And the more that were killed, the better. And um, then he himself was killed by a mortar shell and had a near-death experience and immediately found himself in this hell of an experience. As I referred to that, that experience of a review and feeling all the feelings that you've uh, dished out to others and the pain you've given them and their families. And so for a time, he was in that experience of feeling all of that. And he was eventually pulled out of it by a close friend of his that had passed on a year earlier who appeared. And his friend said to him, hey man, I know that was rough what he had just experienced and felt. But you needed it. You were getting just a little too callous, and that isn't like you. It just wasn't the guy I knew when we played football and hung around together in high school. You are not doing the right thing. You should not be doing this killing. Your mission is to help others, to protect them. You'll learn more about your mission as you go along. This is your home. And you will return, but for now, you need to go back and discover your mission in full. There was a guy named Richard. He also was an eight-year-old at the time. He was hit by a car. He met his guides on the other side. <clears throat> and he shared that what he was told when he got there by the guides or the angels, the helpers, uh, that he could ask questions and that they would provide answers and that he would remember when he returned and that this was important. So somehow, as a soul, this was a way of getting some of the truth over to, uh, into our realm. And so his first question was, is this heaven? And the response that he got from them was, it can be, if that's what you want. It can be hell as well, if that's what you believe. This reality is an extension of you, instantly realized and formed. You always create your own reality, no matter where you find yourself, for we are all co-creators. Second question he asked, where is God? I don't see him. The response, how can you see that which you are yourself a part of? We are all expressions of God. And when you see with your eyes, you see through the eyes of God. And he experiences reality through yours. When you speak to God, you speak to yourself, sort of. We are one and the same. There's no division or separation. Next question, why do I feel like this is home? The response, because it is home. All begins here and returns here. It's the starting point of all journeys and lessons. There was a guy named Wayne, actually there were several people that were, uh, grew up Southern Baptist, and uh, they shared how their experience was totally different than what uh, they had expected or come to learn uh, based on their upbringing about what heaven would be like and, and so forth. Um, going on to what was shared by uh, evil uh, about it, it was addressed. Even Alexander, actually, in his book, Proof of Heaven, in talking about what he learned in his near-death experience, was talking about there not uh, being only one universe, which was interesting, but many universes, again, perhaps many rooms, and that love, was, uh, that love lay at the center of them all. He said evil was present in all the other universes as well, but only in the tiniest trace amount. He said evil was necessary because without it, free will was impossible. And without free will, there could be no growth, no chance for us to become what God longed for us to be. And so <clears throat> he said, as horrible as evil sometimes seemed to be in our world, in the larger picture, love was overwhelmingly dominant. So we should really realize where our attention goes, still love is dominant. He said, I could see, <clears throat> excuse me, I could see the, the, that earth was a place where good and evil mixed, and that this constitute one of its unique features. And there is, again, much more good than evil. That's why, again, it's so important to see the good, because you become part of it. Anita Moriani wrote, I believe that at the core, no one is truly bad, that evil is only really a product of our fears. So true. So how were they different? How were they changed? Uh, how did the near-death experience affect them? What did they take away from them? I'll be sharing uh, a bit of what uh, really stood out for them. Anita Moriani said, I began to remember the details of what had taken place, and I found myself wanting to cry about every little thing. There was a tinge of sadness at leaving behind that amazingly beautiful uh, and free 
uh, other realm, but at the same time I felt happy and grateful over being back, reconnecting with my family. So there were tears and joy, uh, regret and joy. In addition, I felt a bond with everyone in a way I never had before. Not only members of my family, but everyone, the nurses, the doctors, the orderlies, everyone. I had an outpouring of love for each person. I felt as though I were connected to them all at some deep level. So that's that idea of oneness that has birthed. Somehow the world looked brand new, as though I were looking at it for the first time. I saw everything with new eyes, as though I were a child again. Everything and everyone appeared beautiful. There was a magic and a wonder in even the most mundane. I was amazed by the human body and life itself. I saw divinity in everything, every animal, every insect even. I became difficult, it became difficult to engage in conversations, sometimes about everyday events. I completely lost interest in, going, in what was going on in the world of politics and in the news. Yet I was riveted by a sunset on the horizon. I was no longer afraid of anything. I didn't fear illness, aging, death, loss of money, anything. This world still didn't seem real to me. They all spoke of reality being on the other side, beyond the veil, and this all being an illusion, temporary, things coming and going. I found myself grappling with how seriously everyone was taking everything, how stressed everyone was about money and financing, taking life and problems too seriously. I didn't want to get bogged down in the mundane and minor problems, you know, worrying about future and money and work or household issues. It seemed important to have fun and laugh. I also couldn't understand how much people neglected everything else, including love, relationships, their talents, creativity, and so on. She said she was no longer able to draw definite distinctions between what was good and bad, right or wrong. In other words, that would throw her into judgment. And so she just came from total compassion from that point on. She talked about her world being a tapestry, and they use the tapestry, a number of them use that term, and it really, they referring to consciousness. She said the tapestry was made up of all her thoughts, feelings, experiences, relationships, emotions, and events to that point, and nothing exists until it's brought into your tapestry. And she said the purpose of her life was then to expand her tapestry, or consciousness, and allow more and greater experiences into her life. She said, I looked at everything I judged to be negative or impossible in the past, and I questioned it, particularly my beliefs. Why do I believe this? She asked herself. Does it serve me to continue to believe that? I understood that true joy and happiness could only be found by loving myself going inward, following my heart, and doing that which brought me joy. I discovered that when my life seems directionless and I feel lost, which still happens, she said, what it really means is that I've lost a sense of self. She means her infinite self. I'm not connected with who I truly am. The whole is affected by me, she says. If I'm happy, the universe is happy. If I love myself, Everyone else seems to love me. I realize that we never become disconnected from the center. You know, we talk about being centered in that part of ourselves, but we temporarily lose sight of it and don't feel the peace and joy that comes from it. We get caught up in the illusions of separation. And my near death, after my near death experience, she said things got a lot easier. Um, I no longer feared. I learned to trust the wisdom of my infinite self. My ultimate happiness and well being happens simply by being myself. I need only be the magnificent love that I am and allow events and circumstances in my life to play out in the way that I know is always in my best long-term interest. I detached myself from preconceived outcomes and everything that's truly mine actually comes into my life effortlessly in unexpected ways. So there's a big shift in terms of how she was relating to the world around her. Ron uh, had a near-death experience. He was out drinking with his three buddies in high school, I believe it was, and got in an accident and died. And he shared about this about the purpose of life. He said the sole purpose of life, having had that experience, is spiritual growth. And that, put simply, is the process of learning the wisdom and power of universal, unconditional love. And in the end, the only things that matter are the people we help, and the people we hurt. Over and over, near-death experiencers said that where they had visited 
as I mentioned, I think earlier, was reality and that this world uh, was actually an illusion. And one person, near-death experience, was told by a guide or angel the world she was returning to was an illusion and that she wasn't to identify with it, but to be in it and not of it, and that she was only passing through. Have you heard that before? Be in it, but not of it? Okay. One near-death experiencer said, I came to realize everything, everyone, everyone is already perfect and magnificent, but don't realize it. When we're able to realize it and see our own selves as God or expressions of God, only then are we able to recognize God in all others. We see what we are through our eyes. Love is the prevailing force at all times, no matter how things may appear in the world of duality and illusion. In reality, we are not a body. We are a soul, and you need to think of yourself as a soul. Yes, the body is sacred, too. It houses, it's the casing of the soul. But the soul is eternal, and it is our souls that are really living this life. And as one near-death experiencer said, now my goal has become to feel nothing but unconditional love all the time. Ibn Alexander, he said it well, I think he said, I remembered who I truly was out there. I was a citizen of the universe, of a staggering universe in its vastness and complexity and ruled entirely by love. Our role is to grow toward the divine. There is so much more uh, that I would love to share and, and elaborate and expound on about this. Um, I hope you've benefited from it as I have uh, in bringing to the forefront some of these ideas in terms of just how we think a thought ripples on out into the universe, uh, not to take things lightly, and to really be consciously on purpose as we live this life, uh, realizing the difference we've come to make and the soul growth we're intended uh, to make as well. So let this be our goal as well, as I was sharing, as Ibn Alexander said, the goal be to experience and be of unconditional love on a regular basis and to know that we are growing toward oneness in representing and reflecting the divine. God bless you all. Thank you, Reverend Howard. Thank you for joining us for today's message. We invite you to be with us again next Sunday. Unity is inclusive, welcoming people of all walks of life in dignity and love. We believe that love, strength, and goodness dwells within you. May we all live in unity with God, humanity, and all of God's creation. And remember, as Reverend Caesar says, life is meant to be good. When you visit Unity of Houston, you'll find a spiritual community, a church where you can connect and learn and grow with a progressive approach to Christianity. At Unity, we welcome you no matter what your beliefs. You'll find a teaching, loving, inspiring experience as we help each other be all we're created to be. Check us out. We'd love to have you. Find us online at unityhouston.org. And remember, life is meant to be good.